Your business doesn't stop just because you're busy. In addition to doing projects, you need to be working on your business every day and finding new clients. In this episode, Gail talks with Garrison Hullinger, president of Garrison Hullinger Interior Design. This was recorded live during our Operation Thrive event, so if you didn't attend, be sure to listen to the full episode. Will we see you at High Point Market? We have some great events that we can't wait to see you at. On October 14th, you can attend The Pros Know and They're Telling You, results from the 2023 Interior Design Business Survey to power your best business life. Afterwards, catch three top ways to build your business, the lowdown on fees, team structure, and what you want from vendors. Then on the 15th, come see You Deserve to Make Great Money Doing What You Love. And then tell the truth, what real designers do to win at business. You can learn about all of these events at thepearlcollective.com slash events or on the High Point Market website. I am so excited to have my friend Garrison Hollinger here today. He's a president of Garrison Hollinger um, Interior Design. And I have known Garrison for a while. And there was a period when I didn't know Garrison, but he was actually a client of ours way back. I don't even know what year you started following us, Garrison, but ages ago, you were in your attic, as I recall. Mm-hmm. <laughs> which is kind of funny we actually high point market and uh, he had just done a panel discussion so i'm not going to follow your exact intro i'm just going to share a little bit i know okay perfect (laughs) well aaron has three kids that threw me off today i'm like well i don't actually have three children i have two but i have been helping one get to school today (laughs) okay okay i can use some help tomorrow surprise i've got three kiddos now (laughs) sorry gil yeah, instantaneous third kid. <laughs> All right. Well, and so Garrison um, started his business, like I said, in his attic. And what at one point, I think your high as far as employees was what, 32? 34, yeah. 34, mm-hmm. wow. Mm-hmm. So Enough. <laughs> in about 10 years, 12 years? Yeah, this is 13. 13 years. Year 13. Okay. This is year 13. Yeah, that's crazy. So stop and think about that. And Garrison is, he does a lot of different types of work, a lot of commercial work. He's done some um, hospitality work, just did a new four-star re- resort in Deer Valley. And that's a huge project, this conference hotel space, three restaurants, two bars, and probably a whole lot of other things as well. He's also a big speaker in our industry, and he's been on our program several times over the last few years. And we've actually taken some of our boardroom people up to Portland before and had Garrison and his team show kind of the inside operations of its business. So it was fabulous for us to do that. And it was right at the beginning of COVID. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. But today, I'm just really excited to have you here. So Harrison, thanks for calling in from Portland. Yes, of course. Well, thanks for having me. And it's kind of cool to see Arlene Lord is on here from Portland, Oregon, too, oh. um, which I mean, I don't. I probably haven't seen Arlene in I don't maybe those ten years. I don't know. <laughs> oh um, at a fabulous dinner by one of our uh, showrooms, so that was super cool. But of course, you know, I get to hear all about that. And then I saw there's someone uh, Mary from Wichita um, on, that she stated that. So that's my hometown um, from the fields of Kansas. So I'm very excited to be here. Thank you for having me, and to see everyone's faces. All right. Well, hey, we're going to do this interview style and it's going to be, you know me, I don't always follow the questions. <laughs> I know you are. Look at Daniel going like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're so Surprise. used to doing this. And uh, Garrison is good on his feet. So I, I'm really excited about this conversation. And I, I'm going to start off and let's talk about the economy because this is an area a lot of people are just experiencing right now. And I I have a couple of bullet points I'm going to share with you. 
things that I've been hearing and reading. I've been paying a lot of attention to this. The Amex um, economist comes on every quarter and talks about the economy. And it's so interesting going from quarter to quarter and hearing what the economists are saying. And people are, of course, just guessing what's really ultimately going to happen. Um, because we don't know, because there is a part of there are the numbers and what those are telling us. And there's how the people in the world are responding to that. So we can't really control that. And we don't know how they're going to respond to it. All we know is what the numbers are. And then we also know how we feel about it. So um, what I am hearing, and I want to share some of the positives and Garrison jump in any time, but the what we're hearing lately is that the recession will be a soft landing it's probably going to be another 12 months or so and we should see the worst of it over in about 12 months which is really 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 good news um the other thing to keep in mind that usually when we go through these economic periods or there are challenges like we went through covid we've had 9 11 we've had so many things in the past history it's about every three to seven years, we need to be anticipating that something is going to happen. So we've had a couple of big hits back to back because we had COVID and then we had supply chain issues and then we had inflation and there are so many other things that have been affected us. But the good news is inflation has actually dropped. It was 8% in December. And now I, I think it's about half of that. So what are some of the economic indicators you're hearing? Well, I think it's, uh, yeah, I, I think it's still some of the same things that you've stated. Um, it, it is unknown, right? Uh, it's interesting. I, I forget when I did, uh, I texted one of my clients. Um, he's one of the top five investors with USB. Um, and I get to hear him sometimes when I'm on the drives, uh, to CNBC, you know, when I'm listening to streaming in the car and I texted Rob and I'm like, so soft or hard landing, where are we at? And he's like, Good guess. <laughs> um, but I do think, though, uh, you know, for me, uh, we are paying attention. We're always listening. Right. And and I believe some of those things, you know, we talked about, I think, a couple of years ago, stagflation. What was that? You know, things were stagnant and they weren't just really moving. and We didn't know what was going to happen. Um, right now, I'm really paying attention to the rich session. Um, you know, it's sure there's an economic slump that's hitting us that we've all felt. Is that a recession? I'm not sure. Uh, is it a dip in revenue? Definitely. Is it affecting our cash flow? More than ever. Um, and I think these are the things that we're looking at. But I think, you know, for me, I, I'm really trying to pay attention to what the indicators are. And we know that the top 1% have more money than they've ever had and wealth um, since 1989. Those are facts. And I think it's really important to stick to data. And then we have to kind of assess and figure out what does the data mean? Um, you know, high wage earners, they're feeling the crunch. It's, I think that we'll see the C-suite, um, those executive levels. Um, you know, we've talked about Henry before, high earner, not rich yet. They're the ones that feel the crunch. And a lot of times that's who our client is. Um, but don't forget, and just something that I'm latching on to is that the wealthy, the affluent, they are spending money like crazy. Um, right now, we're, they're tracking some of the higher end uh, travel agents that really are catering to some of our clients. They're still seeing those clients are spending 400,000 plus on family and event type vacations. Um, luxury car sales. I don't know if you've heard this report. It's crazy. Uh, it's grown 6% this past year. Wow. Um, $627 billion has been spent on luxury cars, private yachts and jet sales this last year grew 18%. So to $28 billion. So those are the numbers I think that, you know, we look at because those are indicators where the true wealth is and what they're doing with their money. Uh, you know, and you and I have been around a while, um, at least, you know, 10, 15 years in business. <clears throat> um, I, you know, there was a time when I remember the Persian Gulf War. And during that time, I was working in probably, you know, one of the most luxurious retailers uh, in the country. And we saw the affluent and the wealthy lock down and quit spending. We're not seeing that right now. So to me, that I think is to continue to base some of the data you were mentioning uh, for a soft landing. That's my hope. Well, there are a couple of other things, too. For example, unemployment is, or employment is still very, very strong. 
And that was not anticipated. It is continuing to be Mm -hmm. really stable. We are seeing that, of course, we've had bank failures and everybody was freaked out about that for a short time. But then they started getting snapped up by other banks and that kind of took care of some of those problems. And I'm sure you've probably seen that a little bit in terms of how it's affecting the commercial markets, because, of course, interest rates have gone up. Um, and that has affected the cost of borrowing money. So has that affected you as far as commercial? We're definitely seeing that. I mean, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, in the other markets that we're in, um, Oregon, Washington's in a very unique, sad situation for the Pacific Northwest with their business and their futures. But, you know, in the other states I'm in, in Utah, California and Colorado, what we're seeing is, is that, you know, there's no market for investment and for loans right now in the commercial world. Right. And that's, I think, probably what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, I have one architect who he's warning me right now. He's like, Garrison, I don't know. He goes, you're going to figure out what to do. He's like, I have 30 projects and I'm afraid once we see investments open up, you're going to be just flooded with opportunities and you're going to make a decision. What projects do you really want to work on? Well, I haven't heard that in years. <laughs> wow. That's a great news. It's really wonderful. And uh, I, you know, I've been trying to talk to a lot of my network to find out if they feel the same way. And everyone's telling me that they're just, you know, they're waiting for this moment when the investors are going to start turning loose some of their money. Well, what is your percentage of business that's commercial? Yeah, we're 80% commercial hospitality. Yeah. Uh, 20% residential for revenue. Okay. So that is definitely something I'm sure that you definitely are watching all of these indicators all the time. Um, in as far as the residential goes, some of the other things that I like to remind our designers about, because this is not an area that people really notice it exactly, but I've noticed this over the years, and I'm sure you have too, is that we have what I call tax and summer lull. And that's that period of time when around tax time, somewhere in mid to late March and into the late summer, usually July, we see that things slow down for residential designers because people are taking vacation. They've had their tax bill that's come in. um, The kids are out of school. They have all Mm -hmm. of these things happening. So they tend to spend less at that time. The phones ring less. And it it freaks people out when this happens, and yet it happens every single year. So for all of you listening, has anybody felt that this year? And how many of you knew that this was happening and you could anticipate it and you weren't worried about it, but how many of you were totally caught off guard about it? So I'd be curious to see that in the chat. Go ahead and pop that in for us. Anything else that you're looking at for indicators? I know you pay attention to a lot of different things. Well, I mean, I'm, <clears throat> I, I, I love to follow indexes. I, I don't know that I really understood what an index was um, or what that meant probably five, six years ago. I'm not someone who really understands um, the stock market, right? So I try to follow things. And for me, what I've kind of honed in on is really looking at PMIs. I think that um, when you look at indexes, to me, the purchasing manager index, that's true purchasing, right? That's not a prediction. That's why in reality. And, and a lot of times I think when we talk about bookkeeping or accounting, you know, this is kind of how I got it in my head. Maybe this helps is a bookkeeper actually records things that have happened, right? Those are events that have already happened. And so I look at it the same way as, a, you know, for PMIs, what's going on in the manufacturing and building world. Um, what's happening with tariffs? Tariff is a regulator, right? And so that's a throttle on our economy looking at imports. Um, so those are really the indexes I watch because they tell us quickly. Um, another, you know, one of my top secret uh, indexes that I follow to, you know, really think about, um, you know, when the crunch comes on and people talk about like, oh, I need to hire, what do I do? It's, is it time or not? Um, so I look at the architectural billing index. And what that is, that's an index that's um, surveyed monthly, and it tells us what type of contracts are being signed by architectural um, firms. So that index is a true indicator. It's data that we can look at and use, and it's forecasting, because I know that usually it's, uh, you know, the developers are, and for in my world, and also I think residential, is they go to the architect first, then they're going to move into structural engineering, um, and then they're probably going to bring on the interior designer. So... 
And I think that AEC world is something that we all should be paying attention to, the architectural engineering and construction. Um, so you can do a lot of, you can set up searches um, for the AEC uh, or for these PMIs. And I know that's a lot of TLAs, three letter acronyms, um, but they're really important for us to learn as business um, owners, I think. Wow, that's a great tip. What else is there, is there anything else that you keep track of? <laughs> You know, I'm crazy. Um, I, you know, I just, I think it's really important if you can somehow get your handle on thinking beyond your regional market and what today is. If And so for me, um, you know, I track a lot of odd things. I love to look at dimensional lumber pricing. Um, that's what's used in framing of construction that tells us. Um, it's always kind of an indicator too, I think for our business, um, when I have a, you know, really beautiful home we've designed and the builder's like, oh, prices are 40% higher, you know, than they were last year. And it's like, mm, are they? Oh, well, is there, is there data? And I think that a lot of times what that will do is that just to helps us to understand. Um, so I follow dimensional lumber. That's a big one. I also, um, I had, there's certain, um, ports that I follow. Um, you can track the ship, uh, the shipping channels, and you can see what is going on. And I think that that's something that, for me, I watch really close, which you know my whole story on shipping containers um, and that index, what that did for me in 2019 and 2020. Why don't you share about that? <laughs> um, it, You know, I saw something happening that I'd never seen before in um, early, early 2020 in, uh, well, 20 in 2019, December, 2019, uh, and then January of 2020, I started seeing that there were reports of, um, major delays in, um, receiving containers. And it was really interesting in that index. And I, as I started to track it deeper, um, I was starting to see that there was some kind of, um, a cold or a flu or something going around. And that factories were not just closing down for Chinese New Year. They were extending their closures for weeks. Um, and to me, that was an indicator that there's something really, you know, wrong going on and to listen. And, and at first I'm like, okay, what that means is we're going to see delays in materials, right? So fit and finish is really important in our industry. Um, all of the, you know, the, in multifamily, I work a lot in, um, it's LVT. Right. So I really watch that index. I want to know what's going on with luxury vinyl planking. Uh, if you're someone who works, you know, with countertops or cabinets or hardware, you know, that's something you can follow. And what I saw, I was then able to track it by the time I went to KBiz in January, the third week of January of 2020, I knew I'd made a decision that I would not shake anyone's hand. Um, I just started thinking about it and I'd heard rumors about this weird cold thing that was going on. Um, and I made a decision I got, and a lot of the vendors and suppliers I know really well were like, dude, you're weird. Like, what is wrong? Like, come on, shake my hand, you know, lick my face, whatever, like we normally would do, <laughs> right? Do some shots. Um, but I just started thinking about it. You know, if I shake 300 people's hands, what's that doing to me? Um, and so that was my first indicator um, that something was going on. And then all of a sudden we started seeing um, that there was this reports of COVID. Um, and so I was tracking it. I mean, I don't know how much you want me to go into, but I was, you know, I was tracking it. Yeah. Um, by January 20th, I began to think about creating a, uh, business continuity plan. Yes. And to when try we, and figure out what was coming. Exactly. And when we saw you in February of 2020, when we brought our board member, I will never forget that day when you said to us, we were in a meeting and you said, so what are you doing to plan for COVID? And I was just in shock and I could not even fathom what you're talking about. And then the next few weeks I was in New York, of course, right during the middle of the shutdown. I, I mean, seriously, Broadway shut down, the restaurant shut down, everything shut down around us. And, um, and you were right. And what was so strange about this is that I'd never really... I certainly had had the 9-11 experience right after the, um, you know, we had all the terrorist attacks and we had the slowdown. I had to off people, most of my team. 
And so I still didn't know what I left and that's contingency planning. So from I learned that from you. And so that was a really big wake up call for me to be always thinking about contingency planning and starting to look at, okay, things are slowing down. We need to prepare for that. So I was preparing for this current slowdown back around summer of last year. And that was, it was really interesting because I learned my lesson finally. So what I would say to the people listening is that you have to be thinking about okay, what do I do to move forward? But also what do I do in case it doesn't move forward? And what do I do to prepare for that? So we can't always anticipate what's going to happen. No. But, you know, <clears throat> obviously that you put the two and two together, which is pretty darn cool. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and it really helped me think about my business too. And of course, that's where Operation Ignite came from because we did <laughs> an event right after we got back from New York and everything shut down. So in these times when it's a little bit shaky and it's hard to predict what's going to happen, how do you keep your team informed but still keep them motivated? Well, I, I think it's involvement, right? Transparency vulnerability uh if if you know i think if you describe yourself as a we are that you know in our in your marketing we is plural right so there's more than one individual and i feel that whether it's one or 20 um there are key individuals that are part of our business that they deserve you know to be a part which is also then kind of relays um to accountability and so for me, I really do involve uh, key team members and assign them roles. And we, <clears throat> there's, there's nothing wrong with talking about business continuity. Um, and I focus on wins. The wins are really important. And I think sometimes, you know, maybe the win is, you know, if you've got a line of credit paying off you know, the last bit of your line of credit or, you know, getting someone to pay their invoice, whatever that may be, um, and being transparent, you know, what type of financial situation are we in? And I think that's something that a lot of business owners struggle to do. And, you know, I had an attorney uh, in a personal uh, situation that was assisting me um, with a property issue. And, you know, one of the things he, you know, kind of leaned over and told me one day uh, when we were talking about business and stuff, he's like, don't forget, you're a for-profit business. And when you employ people, it is your fiscal duty to pay them and to provide for them. And ever since then, it was kind of like, a, yeah, you're right. And so I need to be open and transparent about it. <clears throat> I think also it's just normalizing stress um, and relate it to the issues that are being faced. It's it's real, It's I think it's okay to talk about. Um, and also that, you know, whatever my vibe is and is whatever I portray to my team um, or those ancillary members or consultants is what they're gonna pick up on, right? Uh, so I have to be honest with them and, and you, you know, you saw me in some dark days in 2020 on some videos and some phone calls that were not so great. Um, you know, I laid off 19 people in one day. It was probably one of the saddest days of my life ever. Um, and, and I never even thought about that. You know, I was mandated by my governor to be home. I wasn't allowed to use my office and, you know, <clears throat> I never thought about my husband being in his own office. He's worked from home for 20 some years and you know, he came in afterwards, I'm literally on the floor crying. Um, and I never thought about, he doesn't really know about my business. And so he heard me go through this moment, you know, where I really had to pick myself up and, and rely on him. And it was probably that a really great moment, you know, to be at the lowest of lows and to have your partner there. <clears throat> but I think, you know, coming out of this is to really, I've learned to continue to be transparent, uh, continue to think forward. Um, I don't know, when you put your mind to it, there's a way around things. There always is. And the thing that I, I think that happens for a lot of people, and I, I want you all to think about this as you're listening to this conversation, that we're talking about some of the things that can go wrong and the contingency planning, which I want to dive into a little bit more in a second. But on the other side of this, from what you're describing and what we all know, there were more millionaires created during the depression. We had even more mm -hmm. millionaires and people increasing their wealth during the recession in 2008. We have had these periods when people think the sky is falling, but guess what? It's not for everybody. 
And the people that are smart and sometimes the wealthiest people, and these are the people we often serve, those people are doing great. So it's really about what is our mindset and what is our determination to go out and get the business? Because if you're waiting for the phone to ring, you're making a mistake. This is about being proactive and thinking about what you can do to build your business at all times. And it should be, it's, it's what you should do. It's just part of your living and breathing as an entrepreneur. This is part of what you have to do every single day is think about where are the opportunities? What can I do to build my business right now? And how can I ignore all this bad news and figure out what's available to me that I can go and get for myself and for my business. What are your comments on that? Well, I think it's, I mean, sometimes it's facing the reality, right? And I always, I think of it as the day after Christmas sell. A lot of times in business, you know, if we think about the retail world, which I worked in for too many years, um, you know, it, there comes this moment where you see those stores and think back, the, the little stores that, um, you know, they've done their job in buying, right? That they're, it's part of their business model to fill their store with inventory. The inventory doesn't sell through a season. Instead of marking it down and getting rid of it and purging it, they send it to the stock room. And then you see that same merchandise out. I mean, has anyone ever been to a store where you see the same merchandise from the previous year? And you're like, well, that's, hmm, well, that's not quite right. Um, well, I think it's the same thing in my business is that some, we need to purge and, and this, that's the time to do it. If you feel, I mean, this is my belief. Um, if I feel like there's a lull, if I feel like there's dead weight, if there's something going on that's lagging, it's time to change. Right. And I, and I think instead of always being, you know, the early adapter, you know, um, a, an early adopter, sorry. I always say I'm an early ad adapter. I like to adapt quickly. I like to be agile, but I don't love to adopt early. Right. I don't want to be the person who's doing the first thing first. Um, but I think that it's, it is kind of your moment. If you feel like it's a little sluggish, if something's not so great, ditch it, take the ride off, whatever it takes, purge it, get it off of you. Um, there is no reason why you should carry that dead weight in your business. And I think then that's when it affects our business life. That's interesting. So the dead weight is, um, well, you brought up a couple of really interesting things there. First, you said, I don't adopt early. And mm -hmm. I, I think that a lot of people want to be on that front edge of things, but they don't necessarily want to let go of things if that's their dream and it's something they want to do. So, well, that's a whole other story. Dreams are, I mean, come on. Right. <laughs> okay. Well, Jump in. Tell me what you think. No, I'm just saying, like, I think that in business, that to me, I feel like that's a parallel. Whatever your dream business is, is a parallel to the reality of what your business is today and how to make it tomorrow. Okay, expand I, on. I feel like, I think that um, we have a business model that we need to follow and you should have a plan. And uh, even if the plan is like, hey, I want to retain this employee and pay them, you know, medical benefits. That's a business plan. So I think that if that's your business plan and that's your model, follow it, dive in deep and go and kind of try and project and continue that. But if your real dream is, is, you know, to, you know, buy Studebakers and turn them into tiny homes, well, that's a dream. That's not, you can't make money off of that. Right. And I think the same thing happens a lot of times <clears throat> when maybe you're approached to do product development or you're approached to do a textile line. You have to really kind of think about that. What's the effect that I have on my business? Um, and do I have the resources for it? So for me, I always say that you kind of have these two channels that you have to run the dream and then reality of your business model, if that makes sense. Sure. Something that you talked about when we were there in Portland in 2020 is your contingency plan. I want to dive into that a little bit more and let's talk about what you did to plan yeah. for what was going to happen, like your layoffs. That was just one yeah. little piece of it. So let's talk about the rest of it. Well, I mean, for me is to, again, I, I'm really fortunate that, you know, I have a, a retail background that, you know, where I was in stores, I became kind of, you know, the expert of operations. I then went to headquarters. Um, you know, we were a rapid growing company of 500 stores. 
um, first store, first retailer to ever reach a billion dollars um, in three years. And so I think that gave me a lot of training and knowledge and belief in myself. Maybe it's not all valid, but it's, you know, kind of like it makes you portray yourself like, okay, I can do this. Um, and the big part is to project and to think through. And, and the one thing I kept thinking about is I'd never had a remote work business. I was always the guy who was like, you can have laptops, but laptops can only be used to travel to these other states for meetings. <clears throat> so um, I knew immediately uh, I had my tech guy. I said, just start buying computers. I don't care. They can be, we don't need laptops right now. If people are going to be working at home for a couple of weeks or a month, let's just buy. So he went on to eBay and some other places and started procuring laptops and computers because we just didn't have bulks of these, you know, computers. Um, and so we ended up buying 25 used computers and he started rebuilding them in the end of January. And I know you thought I was crazy in February, um, <clears throat> but we just wanted to be able to work remotely. And so that to me is part of the business continuity plan. And then we created processes to have a backup for our server. We knew that our server was everything um, and that we had to be able to back up our data and share our data in a way that we'd never shared files before. Um, we had done a lot of remote meetings, so we kind of had that down. And so what we did is we just kind of worked again on our um, flow chart. So I have a, you know, I have a process flow chart of the steps that we go through from the time that you take a discovery call all the way through to issuing documentations or, you know, doing a site visit. We kind of reevaluated what we thought that might look like um, and started trying to figure that out. Then we also uh, appointed key department um, leads, like who would be a point of contact. Um, we kind of already done this a little bit, um, for earthquakes or other, um, you know, natural disasters to have point of contacts, um, and a slight contingency plan, but nothing like this. And so that, I think that was part of it for us was to really try and project out how do we continue operations in business? Because for us, um, you know, really it's, it's our time billing, right? So it's our services that we offer. That's, that's what produces revenue for the company. And I have to look at my projections uh, and, and determine, okay, how do I continue to have employees working billing? Because that's the only way there's revenue. Right. Right. And there's three people. I mean, I have three people that all they do is, you know, spend money on my credit card and buy things every day. Like there's a procurement team that, and so it's, you know, how do you determine what do we do with these people if we're not, you know, if we don't have people signing purchase orders for the next three months? Yeah. So what did you do with them? Uh, they actually became um, couriers. Um, they were moving equipment around the city, um, doing drop-offs of materials. So we had to, uh, we couldn't really, uh, in our city, we were not able to procure uh, couriers the first couple months. There's just such a demand for it. So what we used is we used their personal cars and paid them mileage and all this other stuff. But they, our admin team immediately became couriers to uh, get materials around to each person you know, so it was crazy. You'd, you'd send it to the FF&E expert, and then they would send it over to the person who's doing the interior architecture. And um, But I think that, you know, it's just kind of thinking that through and listening to others. Um, I don't know at all. Um, but I think it's just, you know, really trying to think about, like, what are these headwinds? Um, and then delegate tasks and set internal milestones, you know. And I think that's a big thing for companies. I find in my own company that if we don't set just because we publish a milestone to a client, when's your next meeting? When's your construction documents going to be done? That's great. But what we find is that we have to hold ourselves accountable first. So we're always trying to make sure that we set our own milestones and then we just fall back on our SOPs, right? So standard operating procedures. If, if you know, if you're not really sure what an SOP is, you, I would say that you should probably think about it, right? If you're really trying to scale and grow, figure out what your standard operation, operating procedures are. You can't, you cannot grow without them. I, you, you won't be able to function. It's going to catch you. Yes. Um, and You can only get so far just with just <laughs> aim and fire and <laughs> thing. And good intent, right? And I think people have a lot of skills in our industry and we're, we're so fortunate with the people that we curate and we, you know, we gather and collect. Um, but I always find that the creative, uh, they really need guidance and outline, right? Like, what do you want me to do next? Well, I need you to take the deposit. Um, what do you do next? <laughs> I want you to go inspect at the warehouse. Whatever it is, just have those SOPs so everyone knows um, what the procedure is. Yeah, I hear that. 
Okay, great. Well, here's a big question. And this is one that somebody, that Shannon actually posted over in chat too, mm -hmm. is what, how do you, fill your pipeline when it's empty. And what a lot of people are going through the summer lull, they're coming through that oh, and yeah. still maybe not as busy. So how do you, how do you go about it? Mm -hmm. It's real. Like it's, I mean, it's definitely, um, whether it's, you know, predicted or surprise, um, you know, I call it, I, <laughs> you know, I mean, I have all these weird terms. Gail, I feel like we're on a personal chat and I you <laughs> know, just are. Aaron ring me back in if I'm being silly. Um, you know, but I have this, I call it um, engage VIP marketing. So I have this thing called VIP marketing. Um, and it's where I take my time as a principal and I start reaching out to my top tier clients. Um, and all of a sudden I, Garrison's available. <laughs> And maybe I wasn't as available as I should have made myself six months ago or a year ago. And I just, you know, I kind of have this top list of people um, and I'll just kind of start reaching out to them. It's not my favorite. If any of you know me very well, I'm the, I'm the side door guy. As soon as I go to an event, I can say that I've um, shown up and then I leave. I don't love, you know, being kind of crowd into these events and networking. But so what I do is I just go back through and I start hitting up my past clients, people that I've worked with or those that are maybe have been involved. Um, a lot of times there's uh, consultants or other people I've met, maybe realtors. Um, you know, I used to do Street of Dreams. And so a lot of those uh, properties had realtors involved. And so I'll just start reaching out to those realtors because um, I want to I start creating engagement with the VIPs that uh, will appreciate me and my services. And they also feel like they deserve that service. And um, maybe sometimes, you know, it's a little sly and maybe I'm not, I'm, you know, being not as aggressive as I should, but I'll do it on Instagram. So there's, you know, some top realtors or top land developers and I'll just start stalking them on Instagram. I'm like, oh my God, I love that. How did you do that video? Um, and then all of a sudden, you know, the one guy reached back out to me. He's like, hey, you know, um, we've got this, you know, $600 million project we've been working on. Would you want to do a couple of the condos? And I'm like, yeah, what? I, sometimes that's all it takes, right? Is to be relevant and to be top of mind. And so that's, for me, that's my immediate way. Now for, that works for me. What I have found though, is that it's, that's a lot. Um, my team members are definitely hired for their skill and they fit within their job description and what they're supposed to do. I don't have someone that does business development on my team. So I can't really expect a designer or, you know, my IT guy or my director of finance. I can't expect them to drum up a business and make it rain. That has to come from me. <clears throat> so that's the other thing too, is I think you have to look at reality. You know, if, if a person really isn't um, someone who is going to, you know, drum up business in their daily work and make it rain, are you really going to ask them? So um, that's one of the easiest ways that I do it. Anything else? Any other interesting tips? I know you have some. I don't know how much you're willing to share. <laughs> to fill up the pipeline? Yeah. Oh, well, you know, I just call it dollar for dollars. Um, you know, I'm from a generation where there used to be, uh, what was it? You used the phone. The, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I used the phone. Uh, you know, the telethons, Jerry Lewis telethon and all that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so for me, I just start dialing for dollars. I literally will call people and like, hey, I know I told you I wouldn't help you with that new ADU or your Airbnb cabin that you have. I have time now. Do you want it? And they're like, what? You thought of me? Um, it's not not usually the impression of like, oh, hmm, slow, are you? Um, oh, my gosh, Virginia. Dial and smile. I know. Well, you can. I love that. Oh my God, my team would kill me if I said that. I love that. Um, but I think, you know, embrace your inner dork or whatever that is that helps you um, to be able to get that. And I think that it's, you know, it's it's really having those opportunities that um, it, for me, it's important to keep the pipeline filled. Um, again, these aren't, you know, we're not doing dime on a dime, design on a dime. These are profitable projects. They have to fit within um, our process and what we're willing to do. I'm not going to go move around furniture. Um, so I think it's like really knowing your business and where you are successful and where your profit lines are. Um, and, to you know, it's I'm not looking to go uh, restyle a garage sale on a driveway. Um, we're actually looking for, you know, we're searching for gold. Um, sometimes you get a little nugget, sometimes you get a big gold nugget. 
Yeah, and I think if you, look, uh, you always have to be thinking about how are you building your business every single day, right? Mm -hmm. Not something you take for granted. It's not something you do when you don't have business. You need to be doing it when you have business because you're filling the future pipeline. So yes. don't wait until your pipeline is dry to start filling it because it can take you months to rebuild it. So if you're if you all are feeling that, then stop and think about what period of time were you not marketing? And, and you're going to find if you think back, you'll probably realize that mm, I was really busy. I didn't have time to market. So you always have to make time to market. It is not an option as the owner of your business. So that's what we tell our clients all the time. You have to be working on the pipeline consistently. So here's a kind of an interesting question, but mm -hmm. I think some people have thought about this. Should you lower your fees during times like this to get projects? Because everybody is hungry for work, just like you are. Come on. Oh, my gosh. Um, well, I, you know, of course, I have a different take on this. Uh, I, I find it very difficult to compare myself to my competition. You know, I'm not really sure about their deliverables. Um, and so, you know, for me, I really work more on defining my scope and outlining my deliverables and really to think about what is it that I can offer my clientele. Um, and so, you know, instead of like increasing fees for uh, project scope, I streamline my process. So what I have found is that I, okay, so here's the crazy one. Um, I've not raised my fees or my hourly since 2016. Oh my gosh. Garrison, how but what I've done is I've reduced my deliverables. Uh -huh. I've streamlined my processes. So, and what that means is, is that we now know that there's technology that we're using, there's software, whatever it may be to get across our point, we're able to reduce. So we've reduced our um, hours spent on projects by 40% since 2016. Crazy. But we are continuing to have a set fee that uh, garners that amount amount that's profitable. And so, you know, it's and, and at the same time, it's it's really thinking about how do I streamline my process? How do I really know and lay out for people what they're going to get um, and setting those expectations? Right. You have to inspect what you expect. And I think that it's really important that what we do is we know our business. We know our business so well and the projects that we're doing. I mean, there was a time, you know, back in 2015, 2016 that I, I think we were doing something like 40, 50 kitchens, 80 bathrooms a year. Um, you know, and that's, of course, some of the houses had nine or 10 bathrooms, but I think, you know, we knew our business and I'm able to set a flat fee. Uh, we, we set the expectations. And, and I think that, you know, for us, the flat fee works because I'm telling the client how this works. They're not telling me. Now, should they need to bring in their neighbors, dog walkers, cousins, sisters, brothers, mechanic to look at the plans? that's going to be an ad service and we'll go talk about it. And if someone really wants to go sit in all their furniture, cause I don't have a studio to buy their furniture. That's great. We, that's great. I'll, I can plan for that. That's, a, you know, time and materials by the hour. We can go sit in furniture stores. We can travel to San Francisco. We go to San Francisco design center twice a year to look at and sit at things. Um, so I think there's a way for us to really control what our offerings are, what our deliverables are and our scope. Um, you know, and it's, it's really important also to explain this to your leadership and to your team, you know, how are we doing this? Um, you know, it's, I don't know. I think that, you know, instead of having, you know, four or five client meetings, can I do it in three? And that's what we've done. Hmm. And I think then by having accountability with the client, we, we know what days we, there are certain days I don't do meetings or any kind of client interaction on a Monday, Tuesday. Those are my days that I work with my team and we work on um, any type of the production work that we're trying to get through uh, to get ready for the next meetings. And then if you have your meeting on Thursday, your meeting will be scheduled every four or five weeks. And then your homework is due on Monday or Tuesday. You have to give me your final answers to our meeting minutes that we send out the next business day and we keep things moving, right? So I think that it's also like just really taking control of our process. Um, you know, it's even though I haven't really raised my hourly rate, if I do work time and material, because it is, it's pretty substantial, I think, for hourly rate, um, you know, my leadership, uh, their increases in salaries have been 75% since 2016. Wow. And you, we have platinum benefits. 
you yeah okay and you reduced your um time on these projects by 40 percent so where does where do you make up that 35 more projects mm. so it's right so, okay. so it's volume. so now i can load in properly the amount of projects everyone's on a matrix in our company right and I know you've heard this, um, but, you know, depending on where you're at in your skill set and your, you know, if you're a design assistant, you're required to have seven hours of billable um, time a day. If you're someone who's got three to four years, uh, you're six hours a day billable. If you're a leadership role, you have five hours of billable time a day that you must record. And so they have to follow that matrix. The reason why it fluctuates is because there is admin time, there's leadership time, there's training time that we um, we send people to management training. We have them learn about project management. Um, and I think that by tracking that, I know, you know, I can look into the next quarter, see what really is a pipeline uh, instead of guessing. So we know what's coming down the pipe. Uh, and I think that, you know, it's just really important if we have those, uh, you know, we have a standard that people follow and a matrix. Um, for us, it's, I'll say it again, Sarah, sorry about that. Um, I know I get excited. I'm a fast talker. Plus, I'm also like, I don't know if you guys want to hear all this stuff. Like, uh, um, is this good information for everyone or like okay. getting big nuggets out of this? I hope so. So it's, I have a billing matrix and I think this is one of the keys to success in business for us, especially when you look at it from an accounting or from the banker is to really think about your business and, you know, how do we know that, a person is accountable uh, because they want their paycheck, right? That's what they want. They want their paycheck and they want their life. And they deserve that because they give everything to us. Um, whatever their time slot is to work that day. Uh, you know, if you start at eight and you end at four, I don't care as long as you get your work done and you're billable. So for us, the senior leadership, so I have five people who are in leadership for my company. Those people are required to bill five hours a day of billable work at their rate. And what that, even though we have flat fees, we're still tracking time and we're allocating it to the project right? Uh, it's kind of like cost of goods sold instead of it's on the payroll side. Then I think the next, you know, the next level down, the person who's really their high tech person, their creative designer or graphic designer, for some of our projects, uh, then, you know, they are billing six hours a day of billable work. We got to allow time for product knowledge. We got to allow time for them to get to conferences. And so this is an average that we use. And if I know if that's how they're tracking it, and then the next, you know, then the next person down who's worked, you know, two or three years in a business, um, then they're required to have uh, six or seven hours. So I think that, you know, it's a big piece for us is just to help people have accountability so that they know where they stand in a company and what are their contributions. Okay, so if, if I can just kind of bring it back to Sorry. everybody. No, 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 I, I just, just fabulous. What I want to say is to take away from this, everybody, as you're listening to this, that you need to be tracking your numbers. The numbers are things that he's brought up throughout the conversation today. And what it's telling us is the more that you understand what's driving your business and what you need to do, what those goals are that you need to hit for each of your people, that's exactly what you need to be doing. So here are a couple of other questions that I'm gonna start asking some of the ones from the chat. Mm -hmm. uh, what if you're too slow to build that time? Well, right, you're behind now. Unfortunately, you don't know what your pipeline is. So that's the, that's your miss, right? So you missed on your pipeline. Um, we all have projects that cancel. I mean, they're huge. I mean, it's, I mean, we, I've seen huge projects just pull out all of a sudden this year. Um, I mean, we all face that. That's the unknown. I think for me, I'm always looking, um, I'm looking at my manpower and labor use three uh, months ahead. So if you look at through the quarter, there's no reason if I have contracts in the queue, or even if there's contracts and I know what my process is, and I know that I have meetings every three or four weeks and they're building up to that production work. It's really easy for me to figure out, okay, if Eric sits in this chair, he bills six hours a day times five days a week. It's really easy for me to see what that uh, prediction should be. And I can tell right now, like I know where my problems are immediately sitting here today. I know that I've got to still keep things coming in for December. Uh, we're not quite there yet. So unfortunately, I think that you need, you know, for uh, if you don't have enough work right now, you probably have some other issues to deal with. And in this case, you may have to be looking at, at layoffs. I think, yeah, it's probably some staffing reductions. 
Um, maybe it's time for someone to take time off. Um, maybe they want, you know, to, to reduce their hours, but you know, it's, I think it's a situation where you need, to, I would say you need to shed that off of your shoulders. Um, you know, so you're not carrying payroll that you can't afford so you can actually drive your business. You, it's just too much to deal with. Um, and if that person can't generate revenue and it's you, I think we need, you know, for me, I'm always trying to alleviate what those worries are and not carry the burden, you know, for, and here's the deal. I think that, you know, maybe if you don't mind just this, we all talk about, you know, we're the captain of the ship in a storm waves come huge waves come. And I think that you, you have to like take care of your ship, take care of the other crewmates, keep the commissary going, feed the people, like whatever that is that you do in your business. And unfortunately, if there's one person that, you know, right now you can't care for and tend to them and be fiscally sound, you need to make some tough decisions. It is so hard to do. Oh my gosh. It you sucks. Know, it is the worst. Um, I did it after 9 11 because I ended up going from eight people down to three of us. Oh, and yeah. that was so painful. But you have to do it because there comes a point where, what are you going to do? Go bankrupt? <laughs> you don't want to do that. So, no. or take your own your personal card? No, don't do that. Yeah. Well, um, sometimes, well, I carried people too long just because I felt bad because I was going to lose those people. Yeah. As you get more experienced in your in what you're doing with your business, you realize that. Sometimes you have to just make tough business decisions. You may not like it, but you are the person who is the leader. So you have to do those things. You're looking to make sure that your company is strong. Um, so the thing is, we have to be juggling all of these balls all the time, filling the pipeline, making sure we have the right people on the team, making sure we have processes documented so people can be efficient in what they're doing, training people, giving people feedback. There's just so much to running the business that we have to do and do well in order for us to grow and scale. And some of you may choose not to scale. It's okay. You don't have to. But for a lot of us, we want to build our businesses because that's who we are. We are entrepreneurs that love the challenge of building. So decide what's important to you, but also make learn to make some tough decisions. Okay, here's another question I'm going to bring up. How do you get full remodels instead of just a kitchen or bath remodel? So that's uh, mean, during slow time or in general in business. I wonder. Like, question. So, hmm. uh, Mark, do you want to go ahead and give us a little more data on that? Meanwhile, I'll ask you another question. What do you think about a newsletter for marketing? Well, I yeah, that's your resource. I think if you have, there's something that you can. Um, you know, send out, update people. It's kind of crazy. Uh, I'm, I kind of believe that I shoot random, right? Like once in a while, we'll just like, Ooh, let's send a newsletter out. And it's been, you know, eight months or something. I'm not, I feel like a lot of times when they see it come regularly, they're kind of like delete. Um, but I think that, uh, what you're doing, there's also this persona about, you know, if someone else is a little bit in the slumps and also a little bit like, Ugh not feeling great about their business because most of us are working with the C-suite or the owners. Um, they love to be around positive people who are busy too. So I think it's also like, it's okay to share. It's okay to talk about what your projects are and what's going on. And, and people want to hear that. It also, that I think can spread. The newsletter can also be really wonderful for your tradespeople and the ancillary people for them to know that you're active. You're still there. You haven't retired or given up uh, if they haven't heard from you in a while. Okay, great. I, I think it's great. All right. So there are three questions. I'll see if I can get through these fast. We've got about a minute left. Um, so in general is the answer that Mark had. So he's wanting to know how, in general, any time at all, do I get into bigger projects versus just kitchens and baths? Um, well, I mean, hmm. I mean, I feel like maybe it would be important to, you know, talk to some of the developers that you aspire to work with. I would go after them, right? Um, I think that, you know, if you if you see that there's people out there that you're following or that you've been watching um, that are developing or constructing these homes, start relationships with them. Find out what their needs are. Okay. 
and I'm going to ask you two more. And some of you that came in toward the end was new questions. I'm not going to get to those. I'm so sorry. Um, how do you market to architects? Um, how do you market to architects? I mean, I think it's just relationships. Um, you know, it's we're such a small market here. I, you know, our city's not even 600,000 people. Um, so I think that, you know, to me, it's a little bit more personal uh, to make that connection with an architect. Okay, great. And how about AI? Are you using AI now? Of course. <laughs> um, yeah, in many ways. <laughs> what do you oh, use? Sure. Uh, um, we are finding that it is something that is um, definitely we're using it in our projects um, with Photoshop. Um, we're finding that it is really helping us quickly to be able to illustrate um, beyond SketchUp or Revit um, quickly for people uh, to just get an idea. So that's been really wonderful. We're also using it. Uh, I do a uh, biweekly um, question and answer for my hometown newspaper, and I don't have a lot of time for that. So I also use it for that. Awesome. <laughs> Reaching that and looking for headlines or writing an article. Mm -hmm. all sorts of things. So yeah, it's yeah. very and for, for those of your employees that don't know how to spell and use grammar, sometimes it's good to use chat GPT mm -hmm. and there check it. Um, okay, Garrison, awesome. just amazing. You're always amazing. I love what you share. Oh. And um, just give some love out to Garrison, please. Thank you for being on the call today. And I think we could have talked for about five hours. Sorry. Thank yeah, thank you so much. That was really fun. <laughs> so glad to have you here. Next week, stay tuned for another great talk from our Operation Thrive event. In this episode, Aaron Weir chats with Kate Norton to discuss the idea of selling solutions to clients.